to become mighty vessels i just saw an anointing rest on you this role in the name of jesus i don't know where you are but i pray may that grace now let it rest upon you and shift you to a new dimension in the name of jesus christ welcome to christocentric message on this channel you are going to get soul lifting messages faith-based content prayer drills and videos that would help you grow spiritually remember to subscribe to the channel like the video you are thank you god bless you please be seated i remain grateful for this privilege and this opportunity it is an honor that i do not take for granted and um i am truly very grateful god has been dealing with us walking in us walking through us building us and um, this session will be no different in the name of jesus may i request in one minute that we just ask the lord for revelation and ask him for grace the bible says for everyone that seeketh, findeth can we pray and ask the lord to grant us revelation knowledge there are things that we need to know and he's equipping us line upon line precept upon precept cry to the lord from the depth of your heart and ask him to speak to you and to minister to you so deeply thank you oh my father for giving us your son and leaving your spirit till your work on earth We thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit in your work on earth. Hallelujah. Let me just use two or three minutes and encourage the youth in this church and here represented. Um, just before we get to the word, I just felt stirred in my heart to do that. I challenge you by the Spirit of God to rise to the fullness of your potential and your destiny in Christ. And it's a call it will cost a lot to be great greatness is not a gift but you have the power to contend with understanding hallelujah it is good to admire great people it is good to be to be challenged but do not allow anything intimidate you based on any guys whether background whether this and that run away from the pressure of living a fake life you shouldn't fake what can be real you can walk with the dignity of kingdom integrity and rise to an enviable position hallelujah my life is proof that if you pay attention to god and you strive to understand his ways he will turn you into a sign and a wonder it is true hallelujah so I just thought to encourage someone with this word and then let me challenge parents, elderly ones, do not conclude on people because of certain limitations in their lives. It is true that Jesus died, but he only died for three days. Don't be talking about the Jesus who died, whereas he's come back to life already. 
you will find people many young people with all their troubles and I know that we have families that are full of all kinds of things but I want you to give people hope and to be believing that God is able to use even the most rejected and to turn them into signs and wonders and let me encourage you that if you see an individual or a family going through struggles over their children over their young people it's time to pray for them and not to talk about them because this God we serve can turn Saul into Paul hallelujah praise the name of the Lord as we drove down I, I really didn't see I, I think I saw a walk that was going on there and I was so inspired I was told is um, I hope I'm right the children the children's um, Sunday school and you will be surprised how many things I still can remember the Bible says train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not turn away from it um, my my spiritual foundation started right in this place and I'm honored to have several people few of them still alive here and some have joined the cloud of witnesses and are watching from heaven but I thank God for the privilege of allowing our lives to be consolations to them. And I believe that God is still in the business of raising people. My passion for mission, my passion for the gospel was birthed in this place. It's true. I, not, not, not to flatter, but I do not know of any assembly that has maintained the consistency of praying for people in the mission field every Sunday. I pray we never lose it because it's, it is a treasure. And to keep praying, praying for them, some of us may never be able to go and preach the gospel to the mission field as it were, but our prayers count Sunday after Sunday, week after week. And I want you to know that one day when we stand before him in glory, somebody will walk up to you who you do not know and say, thank you for helping me succeed. And you'll say, how did I help? And you say, for every five, ten minutes you lent week turning to months turning to years turning to decades it was a spiritual investment that was providing support for the work praise the name of the lord and i got so stirred up and challenged in my heart and i didn't just want to start my teaching without at least saying a word on this i have been a beneficiary of the sunday school the children ministry have been a beneficiary of um, the passion for souls it was in this church I had the privilege to learn about Fiji Island and the revival that broke out in Fiji Island many years ago a video was played here just to let you know that the little things we do count we may not receive the global applause. We may not be flattered around by all kinds of people, but heaven is recording. And that everything we are doing is, is being etched in the heart of someone. Praise the name of the Lord. And I pray that we will never get to a point where the generations coming will serve another God. The Bible says, and there rose another Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. Hallelujah. And so, not, not to, not to, I'm not a politician, but I felt stirred in my heart to at least make a commitment to support the missions and the children ministry. <laughs> Hallelujah. It was something, honestly, it, it, is not, it is not for show. I'm only at liberty to say this because this is home. Hallelujah. And so, I'll commit three million naira to this project and I'm not announcing this to gain praises and all of that it is there's, there are two reasons why I'm doing this ordinarily I would not even talk about it number one is to inspire someone while you are sitting there 
that the real value of life is not in acquisitions is to the degree to which your life directly supports kingdom come this is what you'll be learning tonight and then number two just for the sake of accountability but it is my joy to see that God will continue to lift and to raise people can we pray in one minute for the children ministry and the missions in this church just speak a word of blessing and send it to them father we pray that our children will serve the lord they will serve the god of their parents we ward off the arsenals that are launched against children to distract to discourage to frustrate we also pray for the youth in this church Lord that they will believe in their future they will believe in their destinies regardless all that has happened or not happened in their lives that you will inspire them to know that there is hope for a tree even if it be cut off that at the scent of water it can bud again in the name of Jesus Christ amen and amen so we get to tonight's teaching I'll be as fast as I can even though there is so much to say but the Lord will grant us grace in Jesus name I'm teaching on kingdom advancement this is my final session equipping the saints we started with the gospel helping us to understand what the gospel is we said a few things may I encourage you if the CDs will be made available, please do well to get it, invest in it. This is something that you would be surprised that you may not have gotten everything. You may want to sit down. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing. The first hearing is the hearing of awareness, but the second hearing is the hearing that produces understanding. It comes by hearing and hearing. Hallelujah. And then in the morning, we discussed on the subject of growth and maturity that when you are born again or saved as we call it that is only the beginning of your journey into the kingdom we spoke about a number of things and i didn't have the time to touch on certain things like discipleship and doctrine it's very important um, discipleship is the only platform that allows the believer to evolve and to grow methodically into one who has stature, growth, and balance. And the course content in any discipleship platform is called doctrine. It's very important. Doctrine comes from the Latin word doctrina. It means a set of beliefs, an exact information that turns a student to become something exact like you can pick a medical doctor from university of joss pick another medical doctor from say unilag pick another medical doctor from another institution and all of them can meet for the first time in front of a patient and none of them will doubt one another why because it was the same curriculum that raised them so the message is greater than the preacher the only reason why the preacher is great is because of the message. Hallelujah. Kingdom advancement. We'll begin tonight by redefining a few terminologies, three of them, so that we are on the same page even as we progress. Number one, I already stated that, but just for the sake of this session, to define the gospel. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, we started with this verse yesterday. Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He calls it the power of God unto salvation. So what is the gospel? I told us that the gospel has two dimensions and there is the message that saves. We'll take the second part this night. But the gospel as a message is the revelation of the Father's love. Revealed and demonstrated in and through the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus, man and creation being the recipients of that love. You have to understand that creation 
also are beneficiaries of the gospel. It does not just end with man. The second thing I want to define, the second term is ministry. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 17. Colossians 4 and 17. What is ministry? Please pay attention. If you do not understand this concept of ministry, you cannot understand the concept of kingdom advance. This is where the fulfillment of the believer comes from. Ministry. What exactly is ministry? If I ask the average believer to help us define ministry, for many of us, our scope of ministry is a building like this, having congregants or members, a podium or a pulpit like this, then an individual standing behind it and holding a mic or some means of communication and speaking to the people. You're not wrong, but that is not ministry at all. Hallelujah. You have to understand this concept. Now, biblically, ministry has nothing to do with church. Don't write, just listen please. Ministry has nothing to do with being a pastor. Ministry has nothing to do with a mic. Ministry has nothing to do with a sermon. Ministry has nothing to do with a pulpit. Ministry is not defined by the activities that happen, no matter how spiritual. The foundation for understanding ministry is that ministry, listen very carefully, ministry is derived from a spiritual state, not just what you do. Hallelujah. The foundation for ministry is your motive and your motivation, your love for God. Genuine ministry is derived from your love for God and then any activity that you engage in that gives you the opportunity to reveal Jesus and to bring him glory is called ministry. So ministry has nothing to do with the religiosity of the activity. Colossians 1, 4, 17 says, Say unto Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. So we receive that ministry in the Lord, not from the Lord. You have to be in the Lord, walking and growing in Him. And then when His love consumes you, are we together? Any activity that is derived, a response to your love for Jesus Christ and intended to reveal Him and bring Him glory is called ministry. This is powerful. That means you can be a preacher and not a minister. You can be a singer or a musician or whatever it is. You can be around spiritual activities and yet you are not in ministry because it is not the activity that defines ministry. It is the motif and the intent. Hallelujah. It's important to get this concept right so that when I say who is a minister, that would be the next concept. Naturally, you know now that a minister is beyond a preacher. Is that true? A minister is not one who has the privilege to hold the mic and teach. Uh-uh. He is a minister if his preaching or teaching is motivated by his love for Jesus and intended to reveal Jesus and glorify Jesus. Otherwise, he's just a preacher. That means, is it possible to still be in ministry even if you have to fulfill the pulpit, fulfill the mic, fulfill every other thing? Can I still be in ministry by this definition? Absolutely. The pandemic taught us a very serious lesson that we needed to redefine our concept and our ideas about ministry. That means if for any reason I do not have congregants come together and have an opportunity to teach them, can I still be in ministry? The answer is yes. Provided my motivation remains my love for Jesus 
and the intent of my activities remain to reveal him and to bring him glory i am in ministry now just for an illustration please watch this there is a gentleman here who is holding the camera snapping around do you believe that in god's mind this man can be doing the same thing with what i'm doing right now because it is not the activity by reason of social stratification and honor you may clap for me first before him because it looks like i'm more important than him in as much as we define you know relevance and all of that but once his heart if this art of snapping around is motivated by his love for jesus and intended to be a contributor to make sure that you keep memories as revealing jesus what he is doing is called ministry are we together now yes when a woman as i would always use this expression if a woman gets married and gets pregnant and the baby she's carrying like hannah she says lord my my prayer is that you use this baby in my womb to become a tool for kingdom advance that act of pregnancy and giving birth is called ministry hmm. are you learning now if because of your love for jesus and your desire to see his kingdom come you get into business or you get into any circle of influence and God blesses you, you become wealthy and then you see to it that there is comfort and convenience as far as kingdom come is concerned. Your act of doing business, bringing money and being wealthy is called ministry. So a minister is not necessarily a preacher. A preacher is only a minister if his motivation is his love for Jesus and then the goal of using the platform of preaching is to reveal Jesus and to bring him glory. I don't know if we have this definition clear. Very, very important. Now, if I say all the ministers, don't stand, but if I say all the ministers stand, if you remain seated, then we have to look closely and know what is wrong. You see that now. Hitherto, if I had said all the ministers stand, you say, well, I'm not a pastor. But now you know. All the ministers mean all who genuinely love Jesus and are determined that every activity in their lives will reveal him and be a contribution to kingdom come. Stand. That's what I said. Please say, I am a minister. Convincingly, one more time. I am a minister. Please say, I am in ministry. Thank you. If it is true that you are a minister, if it is true that you are in ministry, based on this definition, then we can proceed further. So when we say a minister of the gospel, what we generally mean is that you are in the fivefold as revealed in Ephesians chapter Ephesians chapter 4 where we got the theme for the conference the Bible says he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men the gifts there are not talents they are not spiritual gifts the gifts are men he gave men as gifts to men are we together now and these gifts he called them apostles he gave unto some apostles to some prophets to some evangelists to some pastors and teachers why did he give them please give us the scripture Ephesians chapter 4 from verse um, would that be 11 let's see Ephesians 4 media beautiful thank you why did he give that verse 12 now tells us why he says he gave these gifts that we call the fivefold verse 12 for the perfecting or the maturing of the saints the word perfecting there means to grow to build to mature the saints now I, I wish we can have it projected because I want to correct something there and then would we'll begin to teach verse 12 now 
verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. Please look up. For the work of the ministry. When you read this, you will think what Paul was saying is that to perfect the saints and then for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. But hear what he's saying. Paul is saying the fivefold, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and pastors are actually the gifts that prepare the ministers. That the ministers now matured can do the work of the ministry. So the ministers are not really the men of God as you call it. The ministers are the gifts or the, 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 the gifts. The men of God are the gifts that now prepare the ministers to do the work of the ministry. What is the work of the ministry? Kingdom advance. We're going to discuss that. Are you seeing now? I'm not insulting your theology. You can, I'm just giving perspective as per what we're dealing with. This is very important because for as long as your idea of the minister is the pastor, the reverend, the bishop, and the man of God, the apostles, and the prophet, you are not wrong, but you are not completely right. He gave gifts to men. The gifts are not talents. He gave men as gifts to men. Those gifts now are mandated to prepare the body of Christ so that the body of Christ now matured can do the work of the ministry and then it says for the edifying of the body of Christ till we come to a state verse 13 it says until we attain a state called the unity of faith hallelujah and of the knowledge of the son of God until we come into a perfect man the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ when you read the, the scriptures that follow, it says, Not to stow and fro by every wind of doctrine, nor the slight of men, wherein they lie to deceive. So he's, he's saying the gifts, those we call men and women of God. Of course, you can call them ministers. I, I, I understand. But now because we are doing, this is a conference that is methodically giving us spiritual intelligence. Those you call the men and the women of God are the gifts that now prepare the ministers. Hallelujah. Hmm. So every time you talk about ministers, see that on one hand, you are right to talk about the fivefold, but in addition to the fivefold, every believer who truly loves Jesus, and every believer he, who is about revealing Jesus with his life, with his profession, and everything around him comes under that category too. Praise the name of the Lord. The second thing I want us to get is our corporate mandate as believers. Now, as individuals, Equa Plateau Church has its theme and its vision, the mandate that it runs with. Is that true? Several ministries, para ministries, um, you know, organizations here would have their visions that define why they exist. I want you to know that as believers, regardless denomination, regardless your spiritual affiliation, regardless your spiritual experience, we have a corporate mandate that binds us. And I want to reveal this to you. Two scriptures. John chapter 1 and we'll read 6 and 7. John chapter 1, 6 and 7. Therein lies the corporate mandate for every believer as far as kingdom come is concerned. The Bible says there was a man sent from God. Please say after me, I am sent from God. This is a very powerful revelation. You, were, you only pass through the womb of your mother but you were sent from God. You have to be conscious of that divine identity. If you know you are sent from God, then you can agree that you can be a gift to the world. Are we together? Sent from God, and then you pass through Plateau State, Taraba State, Lagos, Abuja, 
This is only the geography where your physical body found expression. But you are a man sent from God. And the Bible says whose name was John. Why did he come? Verse 7. This is our corporate mandate. May I request that we please read it together if you do not mind. Ready? One to read. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. That's it. For as long as God gives you the gift of life, you are alive on earth today. This represents your corporate mandate. That the reason why I have come here is that I have come for a witness to bear witness to the light that through my witness men might believe. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus was giving his final words before he would leave to heaven and he made a very interesting statement. Verse 8, he says you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and then he says you shall be witnesses very interesting word witnesses he never said you shall be men of God he never said you shall be businessmen he never said you shall be a pharmacist a doctor an engineer he never said you shall be a parent he said you shall be Every other thing you call yourself is just the geography of the witness. But you are a witness. Who is a witness? A witness is a validator. Many of us here are into legal practice. You do not need a witness in the court of law until there is a contention. Is that true? Yes. So the assignment of a witness is to make sure that a statement that was made remains as true. Every time you contend with a statement, the judge will ask you, do you have a witness? The assignment of a witness is to be the validator of a claim. Listen, there are many things that God said in the Bible. There are many things Jesus said about God and himself. And Satan and his cohorts are all about the earth, disproving the integrity of God. And like that righteous judge, he's asking, where are the witnesses? that will show creation that everything I said is true. Are we together now? So more than looking at yourself as a preacher, more than looking at yourself as a doctor, a pharmacist, a professor, a learned colleague, a successful person in the oil and gas industry, from a kingdom perspective, you are a witness. Your assignment, you see, Terrorists understand this concept. So, a terrorist can actually send one of their... You are wrong. As far as he's concerned, I am a terrorist. That means the believer, even though you may have your geography of witness, we're getting there shortly, you must have this, this mindset that I am a witness more than what I do this is my state I am a witness a validator of a claim there is as a preacher there is something you are validating as a career person there is something you are validating claims that Jesus made in scripture are we together now I told us that our corporate mandate let me put it in a structured way so you can write our corporate mandate as believers is that in and through our lives Jesus is revealed and Jesus is glorified our corporate mandate as believers is that in and through our lives Jesus is revealed and Jesus is glorified. That means no matter what you become and no matter what you do, if kingdom come cannot find expression through your life, through that job, as far as God is concerned, you were only the practitioner of whatever career, but not a witness. 
I can tell you the reason why darkness continues to loom around our horizon is because there are many preachers, there are many career people, there are many business people, but there are few witnesses. Few witnesses. May God find witnesses in this place. In the name of Jesus Christ. The first dimension of the gospel, the message that saves. Now, the second dimension of the gospel I told us yesterday is the ideology that transforms. This is very powerful. Please write the word ideology down. If you do not mind, please write that word down. Ideology. Ideology comes from the word idea. The word idea comes, it connotes a value system, a mindset, a way of thinking. Now we're discussing kingdom. Your ideology is a sum total of your perspectives, your viewpoints, your mindset. Please do right. That your ideologies represent a sum total of your value systems, a sum total of your perspectives, your viewpoint. There are a number of cameramen doing their work while this service is going on and every one of them is standing at an angle. Say for instance, the gentleman standing at this angle may not be able to capture the people behind him. Is that true? Now if he's asked to convey everything that happened in this meeting from his perspective some people will be lost out of the meeting but that does not mean they were not there it was the limitation of his perspective are we together now this is very very powerful because there is this kingdom you see has a value system the value system is like a software is a value system that seeks to enthrone christ and his purposes so there is the dimension of the gospel as the message that saves an individual. But it is the value system that leads to societal transformation. Without the value system of the kingdom, it is impossible for a territory to be changed. You may have individuals who are saved, but the territory will continue to plunge into decadence. Do you know why? Because every territory operates based on value systems mindsets we call them a mindset is a sustained thinking pattern that is derived from various means number one culture number two your past experience number three your level of exposure number four your relationships number five the summation of your experience is good or bad they, they construct an idea about God, about life, about success, about failure, about Satan. Respectfully speaking, I submit to you. Did you know that if you travel almost anywhere around the world, there are places where Nigerians live. And you do not need to know where they, maybe where they do business, restaurants. And you can enter a Nigerian restaurant and you don't need to ask if this is Nigerian restaurant. They will replicate Nigeria verbatim. Are we, is, is that true? Yeah. When you go into the U.S. Embassy, if you were blindfolded and you suddenly appeared there, you, and they told you you were in America, you would believe. Because there's nothing there. It is not, the building is a reflection of a value system and a mindset. Are we together now? Yes. Until this is the key to territorial transformation. I'm showing you why certain territories remain the way they are. In spite of revivals and preachings and conferences and prayer and fasting. It looks like the territory remains unchanged. It is a reflection of a value system that has become a stronghold over that territory. Is God helping us? The ideology that transforms. That means if I look at a believer in Kano and a believer in Lagos and a believer in London and a believer in US, 
regardless the the geography there is a way you should speak there is a way you should act that makes me know that you are my brother you are my sister because we have been cultured in a similar way since we come from the same kingdom do you agree with me on that we are unable to change our territories because for many we have not tapped into that dimension of the gospel that is an ideology that transforms we know the message that saves through evangelism but most have not learned the value system that transforms society and let me tell you this it is a big deal that our societies are transformed do you know why because like lot you can be a righteous man but if the name of where you are staying is Sodom and Gomorrah you will still suffer even though you are a righteous man is that true for instance respectfully speaking we see that Africa and even our dear nation has suffered from corruption my question is are you corrupt as a person no I believe and I hope hallelujah but then every one of us here has had to suffer the consequences of corruption is that true this is what happens when a territory is not transformed I will tell you this it is not buildings that transform territories no it is not the vegetation that transform territories all of those things are report cards ideologies transform territories for as long as we sustain the thinking and the ideology that kept us where we were there would be no room for improvement regardless how we go around it are we to is that true now let me say this respectfully speaking from from a developmental standpoint if we are to switch nations and over 200 million Nigerians are suddenly moved to the US and everybody in US is moved to Nigeria and we say nobody travels again you are not going no coming out like Jericho no going in and no coming out after 10 years let me tell you what will happen are you ready to hear what will happen or do you know it already Praise the name of the Lord. Another example. Now, this is respectfully speaking. Let's assume that there's somebody who just cleans in an office. That's his work. And maybe the person receives 20,000 or 30,000 and now he's complaining and he said my boss is not doing anything all he does is to sit down behind a laptop signing some files and he's receiving millions in a room with AC and look how cruel and wicked here is my proposition switch them just switch them that means pick the man and say for the next one month you will be in this office let me attempt to describe for you what both of them will do. Are you ready? Let's start with the CEO who now goes to the gate. The first thing he's going to do is he's going to look for a system to automate the opening and the closing of that gate. He can't be pushing it like that. Now watch closely. Watch what is happening to the gate. His mindset is reflecting on the gate. The second thing that happens is his sense of courtesy and decorum both in terms of dressing and communication will provide the solution there at the gate so there may not even be need to come inside that office again are we together the third thing that happens is that he's going to build quality relationships and soon somebody through relationships will put a canopy there and fix up that place let's go to our man in the office let's find out that there's i'm going somewhere please pay attention let me tell you the first thing the man there number one he knows he should not be there so the first thing he would do is to open the fridge what is here what look at this drinks assorted drinks assorted biscuits 
and he will now begin to eat and carry a very important document and use it to hold because he does not know the value of the information there. That is the document that represents the contract the company is pursuing. He will use it to wrap maybe bonds or something there and now he will eat it and keep the place will be unkept. That room will start reflecting his mindset. It will be dirty, unkept. Eventually he will be frustrated and then he will blame it on the building and run out. So the question is, who was really the CEO? Was it the person or the mindset? Let me give you the last example. Thank you for following. Let's say we have two people stand here and one person is called a powerful man of God and another person is called an arm robber. If both of them drop dead, who died? Do you call the dead body a man of God? Do you call the dead body an arm robber? You call them dead bodies. So who was really alive? If it is true that both of them are now dead bodies, subject to the same thing, what made one greater than the other? The mindset and the ideology. Hallelujah. Now, if say the arm robber comes to Equa Plateau Church and listens to the gospel being preached and he comes out to surrender his life to Christ and now that gentleman becomes mentored five years down the line. He's now a powerful man of God. Same body, same voice. What changed? A naive young man who holds his admission letter into the College of Medicine. You call him a medical student. Fast forward 10, 20 years, that person is a doctor attending to patients. Same voice, same everything. So what was the lecturer educating? What qualified him to be called a doctor? It wasn't like he became muscular or less muscular necessarily. It was the mindset. You see, dear people of God, this right here is where the battlefield of transformation is. Until you are willing to submit your ideologies to divine vetting so that that which is inconsistent with the character of the kingdom is edited from your life, there is no possibility of change. It doesn't matter whether it is an anointing service, respectfully speaking, a communion service, prayer and fasting, night vigil, it will end up being a burdensome ritual until and unless your mindset is malleable enough to be transformed. Now, let me tell you what transformation is not. Transformation does not necessarily mean being exposed in terms of westernization. Because for many of us, we think transformation means I used to take pure water and now I take water that, you know, um, not necessarily. There are many, many, many wrong things people have learned in a, in, in a bit to show that they are transformed. Are we together? Secular enlightenment is not necessarily transformation. The reference for the believer's transformation is scripture, not territory. Let me repeat. The reference for the believer's transformation is scripture, not territory. That means learning the culture of another territory that seems to be more superior than another territory is not transformation. No. It is true that when you travel out of this nation, you may meet a society that is a lot more civil. There's decorum, there's law and order. And by staying there and learning their ways, generally, your approach to life will be more orderly. There will be greater sense of dexterity. I agree. But that does not translate to transformation. Transformation for the believer has its reference from scripture. If the word of God is not the basis for the new ideas that you have, you are only moving from fire to an ocean. You will still die. It's only a matter of time. If you come out of a burning fire and you fall into an ocean, are you free? It's just another kind of oppression. Maybe you will last longer. In fact, you will be surprised 
that you may die faster. The fire has heat and pain. But at Jonah, the water will have whales and fishes that can prey on you. But, but are you getting what I'm teaching you now? The ideology that transforms. So you may ask me, what then is the difference between two believers who love Jesus, serve him sincerely, all born again? I will tell you, the difference among many other factors is that one has submitted himself to the ideas of scripture and is willing to be disloyal even to age-long ideas sometimes you know our loyalty respectfully speaking to very old cultural old sociological ideas we feel guilty because it looks like if i have to give this up to pick up the idea of scripture it makes me feel weak so even in the midst of pain we will still hold on even in the midst of failure we will still hold on to wrong negative and destructive ideas the key to transformation is not discussion is the willingness to submit ourselves to scripture based i emphasize scripture based not western based respectfully speaking not european based not american based not asian based it must come from above because it is only he that comes from above that is above all hallelujah this is very powerful seated here tonight and following by way of television or the internet are men and women who are asking questions why is my life not counting why am i not making the kind of definite advancement that i need to make in my life in spite of the fact that i love jesus i have an answer the answer is found in ephesians 4 and verse 18. it says having their understanding darkened being alienated from the life of god through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their mind apostle paul was teaching us and he said the assignment of the god of this world is to blind the minds of people hallelujah very very important concept so we must be willing therefore to probe and vet meticulously where we got our mindsets from my beliefs as a summation of everything that i know where did it come from and can i tell you we must be willing no matter how long we've held on to these mindsets if and when we find out that they are not kingdom compliant and they are not pro scripture we must sustain the unashamedness to replace these old ideas with that which is consistent with the kingdom this is the only condition to transform our society remember our teaching yesterday when Adam fell and the Lord came to him in the garden in the cool of the day he said Adam where are you Adam said I heard your voice and I hid because I was naked next question who told you who told you you cannot prosper who told you you must live in anger and bitterness who told you you cannot walk by love and the dignity of kingdom integrity and prosper who told you that you cannot enjoy longevity who told you you cannot enjoy health who told you that your life cannot be a testament of god's mercy someone told you it's time to vet that voice because paul said there is as it were many voices and that none of them is without significance this conference is a moment of deep reflection to be able to sit down and say why are things not working in my life why is my life not reflecting the glory of god remember what we said about giving excuses yesterday that every time you transfer blames you also transfer authority if my life is not working i must take responsibility under god and find out what could be wrong could it be my belief is there something i have believed about god or not believed about god that is making satan to seem to prevail over me is there something i do not believe 
what is my ideology about life respectfully speaking for some of us we believe that life is an endless circle of struggle and pain where nothing ever happens well now if you hear teachings that have to communicate the favor of God you may reject it not because you are wrong but that experience was not captured in your background so when God says I want to bless you you may not believe it are we learning please write this down the key to kingdom advance the key I will define kingdom advance shortly the key to kingdom advance is evangelism and influence the key to kingdom advance is evangelism and influence blessed be the name of the Lord please look up thank you I have given you a very powerful key every time you say Lord we desire your kingdom to come or your kingdom to be advanced advancement of the kingdom will be at the mercy of two keys key number one is evangelism and respectfully speaking we have done marvelously well on the plateau and even across the middle belt and the north there are people who have spent their lives and spent their days seeing to it that they move from place to place region to region some of them on account of that commitment have today joined the cloud of witnesses we have done well but i submit to you that there is a dimension of the gospel that we may be missing is called influence let's define influence please what is influence influence is the capacity to have an effect I'll take it slowly so we write is God helping us tonight influence is the capacity to have an effect on the mindsets and the convictions of a person and a territory I'll take it again influence is the capacity to have an effect on the mindsets and convictions of a person an individual and then of a territory influence is the capacity to have an effect on the mindset of a person the convictions of a person and that of a territory hmm. hallelujah please give us mark chapter 1 Mark chapter 1 I want to show you through the life of Jesus the power of influence if it is true that our lives and our territories are a reflection of our mindsets ideas and convictions then we need to investigate who is the person who is behind the scene manipulating our mindsets because that means that is the person who is defining our civilization do we agree on that verse mark chapter 1 let's begin our reading from verse 21 the bible says and they went into capernaum this is jesus and straightway on the sabbath day he entered into the synagogue jesus now and taught next verse the Bible says they were astonished at his doctrine for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Uh -huh. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit and he cried out saying let us alone what have we to do with thee thou Jesus of Nazareth have you come to destroy us I know thee who thou art the Holy One of God. 25 and Jesus rebuked him saying hold thy peace and come out of him go ahead go ahead media and when the unclean spirit had torn him he cried with a loud voice and he came out of him uh-huh and they were all amazed 
in so much that they questioned among themselves saying what thing is this what new doctrine is this for with authority commanded he even the unclean spirits and they do obey him 28 please read with me if that if you can see ready one to read and immediately what happened his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee now I'll continue the reading myself next verse please and forthwith when they were come out of the synagogue they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John and Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever and anon they tell him of her be patient please and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up and immediately the fever left her and she ministered unto them and at evening when the sun did set they brought unto him this is the result of the influence they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils 33 And he came, oh dear. What, what verse is that? Please continue. And all the city, we're reading 33 now. All the city were gathered together at the door. Can we be patient to let them? Okay. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. The Bible says, and in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place to pray. Verse, and Simon and all they that were with him followed after him. May 47 be your testimony. Are you ready? Please read with me. One to read. And when they had found him, they said unto him, all men seek for thee. This is is the epitome of influence when all men seek for thee all men there means all people groups there is what you can have that only old people will look for you there is what you can have that only young people will look for you there is what you can have that only your tribesmen will look for you there is what you can have that only intellectuals will look for you but there is what when you possess, all men will seek for you. This is the definition of influence. I will tell you this. There has to be a mechanism that the church will bring to the table that will compel all nations to now begin to come. Chasing sinners one by one is becoming a risk today because of the reality of the time. There has to be an intelligent invention and there is, it is called influence. I define influence as the ability to compel men to buy into your ideologies without using force or cruelty. It's called influence. That means you are able to exert um, a force upon men Causing them to buy into your thinking and your ideology without oppressing them is called influence. Believers, we must trust God for grace that in addition to be people of evangelism, we must obtain grace from God to rise to positions of kingdom influence. If we miss out on the influence part, the program of God is going to suffer. Now, I don't have time to teach this, but I'll just give you four pillars of influence and then we'll jump to the last stop topic and then we're done. Thank you for your patience. I'll give it to you just in summary. Pillars of influence. That means if you want to become a person of kingdom influence for the sake of his majesty, there are four pillars. Number one, the first pillar that controls influence is called growth and transformation. You command influence to the degree to which you contend for growth and transformation. What does it mean to be transformed? To sustain superior belief systems. 
our world will always gravitate towards people that they perceive to have superior belief systems hallelujah very important the second pillar of influence is called value and productivity value and productivity my sincere apologies I'm just running through it so I can't give us all the scriptures that are there but let's try at least let me give us two Proverbs 18 and 16 please write under value and productivity Proverbs 18 and 16 and then Exodus chapter 31 from verse 1 to 5 the second pillar of influence is value and productivity that means nobody will seek for you until they perceive you to be valuable and to be productive hallelujah pillar number three wisdom and excellence the third pillar that compels influence is wisdom and excellence Daniel chapter 5 please for reference 12 to 15 Daniel chapter 5 12 to 15 the Bible says that Daniel sustained an excellent spirit even through Babylon Daniel 5 12 to 15 then Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10 in fact I like us to read Ephesians 3 and verse 10 let me quote it for time's sake Paul was speaking to the church in Ephesus and he says to the intent 3 and 10 to the intent that now unto principalities and powers in heavenly places but might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God that means there is a level of wisdom and excellence that need to proceed from the church are we learning a quick recap the first pillar is growth and transformation I didn't give us a scripture for that let's let's do Psalm 78 and verse 41 for that point now they limited God in the wilderness by saying can God make a way for them and then Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8 Psalm 78 41 Philippians 4 and verse 8 hallelujah the second is value and productivity the third is wisdom and excellence the fourth are you ready the fourth pillar that controls influence in our world is wealth and abundance hmm. wealth and abundance I assure you by God that for as long as the church does not seem to probe into the subject of wealth and abundance from a kingdom standpoint now I'm not talking about marketing of flesh materialism and some of these wrong things there are there are many abuses in the body of Christ I agree but just because of the presence of something that was mismanaged does not mean we throw the entire baby under bath water I can tell you this when the church becomes poor we will lose influence it's as simple and as honest as that let me show you a scripture that I hope will bless you Genesis 42 verse 1 and 2 if we continue to sell the idea that it is comfortable to remain poor and remain in economic bankruptcy we may be doing ourselves and our children more harm than we know while there is need to cut away from the overemphasis on money 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 materialism that has destroyed people today people have lost integrity completely i agree but within the confines of scripture we must introduce this truth and teach it in a way that empowers believers now when jacob saw that there was corn in egypt please look at this scripture very carefully i don't have a problem with the corn the problem is the location egypt is not where you should go to yet that is where there is corn jacob saw that there was corn in egypt he told his sons why do you look on one another verse 2 <laughs> and he said behold i have heard that there is corn where get you down tether and buy from us from there that we may live and not die even a man of god without corn will die 
Jacob was a covenant man and death was facing him right before his face because of the absence of corn. Do you know how Israel became slaves in Egypt? This was the journey. The search for corn took them there and when they found out that it was a place of corn, they stayed there till Joseph died and they became slaves. Hunger will always take Israel to Egypt. Let me repeat. Hunger will always take God's covenant people to the place where they should not go. Unfortunately, when Satan wants to attract believers to a life of decadence and decline spiritually, he will manipulate the economy such that only Egypt will have bread. And sooner or later, believers will begin to quietly navigate towards Egypt. And when they go there, they won't buy the bread and go back. Remember, the intention was just to quickly buy and go back. But when you find out that bread is only in Egypt, you stay there. So when we say things like, our children are following wrong men and the rest, are is it? <laughs> it will continue until there is an alternative. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. But that is the truth. By the time a mother is watching her child die in the hospital, needing 2.5 million for surgery, and you say, don't worry, don't compromise, don't do anything. God will provide. And she's watching her child cry and say, mommy, will you let me die? Let me tell you, pressure has a way of initiating things you never imagined you will do. I have, by reason of what I do, I've had the honor and the privilege to talk to kings, professionals, politicians. I can tell you, many people are intrinsically sincere. Hunger took them to Egypt. Now they became slaves in Egypt for 430 years. And when Moses came to advocate their exodus, you know what happened? Moses stood before Pharaoh, his half-brother, now Ramesses, who had now become the Pharaoh of Egypt, and said, Thus said the Lord God of the Hebrews, let my people go. Hear what he said. The people, we are giving them straw for free while they walk. So the remaining time they have, they can use it to serve God. Don't give them straw again. Let them look for it by themselves. And they said, Moses, forget about this, this exodus idea. We are willing to stay as slaves. My Bible says the borrower will always be slave to the lender. So intelligent people, what is another word for a slave? So if the nations want to make slavery out of Africa, how do they make it? Your Bible says it. It says the rich will rule over the poor. I hope you are not misunderstanding what I'm teaching you. It is true. Let me tell you this. The gospel is free, but the means to take it to the lost. I always will say this, that the name of Jesus is heavy. It takes resources to lift it up for nations, the nations to see. The dead body of Jesus is hanging on that cross and no man had the influence to bring it down except one man of influence called Joseph of Arimathea. Is it in your Bible? He used his influence, his wealth and his relationship to now go to Caesar and say, please release the body. Your salvation required influence to happen. The tomb, he took responsibility he said, no problem, it is my estate, it's my tomb. I will bury Jesus there. Otherwise, the body of Jesus would have remained on that cross. You would never would have been able to say, oh death, where is your sting? And oh grave, where is your victory? Because someone of influence participated in redemption. They buried Jesus there and he resurrected by the glory of the Father. The fourth pillar is well. Dearly beloved, I hope you were blessed by this message. I want you to keep doing something for this man of God, our man of God, Apostle Joshua Salmon. And that is, I want you to keep on praying for him that the cause of the gospel may have free flow in him. 
that he may be granted boldness to continue with his commission of Jesus Christ and that all provisions be given unto him as he continues in this journey of Christianity. And then don't forget to like this video. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you are new here. Don't also forget to leave a comment in the comment section and then keep sharing, keep sharing abroad and let's all keep sharing Jesus. I'll see you again. Bye.